Welcome to a very normal therapeutics employee training video. In this video, we'll talk about some parametric families. We'll talk about what they are, why they're important, and we'll use a little bit of code along the way. At the end, I'll show you how to connect the relevant concepts so that you have a more solid foundation in statistics. If you're new to the channel, let me break character for a bit. My name's Christian and I'm a PhD student in biostatistics. The goal of this channel is to make statistics easier to understand so that others can better apply it to their daily lives to stay informed. Employees should watch the previous training video on probability distributions, but I'll try to provide enough context here. We observe data in the real world. We can predict what values these data will take ahead of time, so we convey this idea in the form of a random variable. Despite this randomness, if we know the probability distribution, then we'll know the relative frequency that will observe different values. Probability distributions are also known as the data generating process, or the law of the data, since the randomness in the data adhere to this function. From our perspective, we only ever see the data generated by the probability distribution, and never the distribution itself. This is a core problem in statistics. Knowing the probability distribution lets us derive many values of interest, but it's fundamentally unknowable. We can estimate the probability distribution, but this can be hard. For continuous random variables, we'd have to calculate infinitely many values to estimate it. We could try binning values and estimate the probability distribution with the histogram. This is fine, but for the purposes of this training video, we'll assume another strategy that can easily give us the function we want. Instead of assuming that the probability distribution is some generic function that satisfies certain properties, we'll assume it comes from what's called a parametric family. A parametric family in this context is a collection of probability distributions that share special characteristics. In notation, we usually depict the parametric family as S underscore theta, or P underscore theta. Like their name suggests, a parametric family of functions will have one or few values called parameters. Parameters here are just numbers that decide the shape of the function, but they can also represent specific ideas, which we'll see more of later. Parameters, as a general idea, are typically denoted with the Greek letter theta. When we start looking at more specific parametric families, different letters might be used. Instead of needing to estimate infinitely many values for the probability distribution, we only need to estimate a few. Our goal is to know the probability distribution, and assuming a parametric family can make this easier. I previously mentioned that the unifying concept between statistics and probability is that statistics, functions of data, have probability distributions. While this is true, we can also model real-world phenomena directly as random variables. In many introductory statistics classes, students will jump straight to assuming that these are parametric families, without appreciating why we make that assumption in the first place. But this assumption only simplifies the problem, it doesn't solve it. We still need to figure out what the probability distribution is, based on the data we collect, even if it's a parametric family. This is the problem of estimation, and we'll cover this in another video. We can also view the parametric family assumption as a simple statistical model. In this context, a statistical model is a mathematical approximation of the probability distribution, or data generating process. The statistical model converts a real-world quantity of interest into a number within this model, usually the parameter. If the statistical model is a reasonable approximation, then we can start to peer into the complex real world through the eyes of the parameter. Some parametric distributions are so common that we've given them a name to make them easier to talk about in discussion. We'll discuss a few to give you a taste. The uniform distribution is named because it assigns the same probability to all values that the random variable can take. If a random variable has a uniform distribution, we refer to it as a uniform random variable. The same will apply to other named distributions as well. It has two parameters, which will denote as A and B. A denotes the minimum value that the distribution can take, while B denotes the maximum value. The uniform distribution is useful for modeling fair events, which is why we usually see them used for stuff like dice rolls. The dice roll is an example of a discrete uniform distribution. The minimum is 1, and the maximum is 6. Decimal values are not possible in a six-sided die, so no probability is given to them. For a discrete uniform random variable, the probability distribution looks like this. This value in the denominator denotes the number of all passable values that the random variable can take. Each of these values will be given the same probability. Uniform random variables can also be continuous. Given these two parameters, the probability distribution of a uniform random variable is given by this function. This fancy function here is an indicator function. It takes the value 1 when the condition inside is true and 0 otherwise. This value here ensures that all the values between A and B are given the same probability. 
Continuous uniform distributions are useful in Bayesian statistics, where it can convey an uninformative prior, meaning that we have no idea what the parameter value might be, so everything should be equally likely. The Bernoulli distribution is named after statistician Jacob Bernoulli, who worked extensively with this particular distribution. A Bernoulli random variable is discrete and can only take binary values, 1 and 0. This makes the probability distribution very easy to write down. Within the probability distribution, we can see that a Bernoulli distribution contains a single parameter, p. If we think of the number 1 as indicating that some event happened, which we'll call a success, we can interpret p as the probability of a success. A coin flip is an example of an event that can be modeled directly as a Bernoulli distribution. For a fair coin, the probability of success is 0.5, or 50%. Anything that's a yes or no event can be modeled with the Bernoulli distribution. In clinical trials, this could be whether or not a person responds to treatment. In A-B tests for an online platform, it could be whether or not a customer goes through with a purchase with a slight change to the user interface. As a model, the Bernoulli distribution tells us these events happen with some probability p. It doesn't care about other factors that might influence this probability, it only uses the single parameter. If a Bernoulli distribution models a single coin flip, then a binomial distribution models multiple independent coin flips. Here's the probability distribution for a binomial random variable. The parameter p here represents the same idea as in a Bernoulli distribution. The letter n indicates how many coin flips there are. In many cases, we consider this value to be fixed, so p is the only parameter of interest. This second term represents the probability of observing k successes. If we know how many successes there are, we automatically know how many failures there are, which are represented by this third term. Finally, this first term accounts for different ways that there can be k successes and n minus k failures. When n equals 1, we get back the Bernoulli distribution. Going back to the clinical trial and A-B test examples, it would be more appropriate to use a binomial distribution to model the data, since there are usually many people that participate in these experiments. The Poisson distribution doesn't get a lot of love, but it's worth mentioning here. This distribution is used to model count data, which is constrained to the positive integers. The probability distribution is given by this equation. For Poisson distribution, the parameter of interest is lambda, which represents the average rate at which an event happens over a given amount of time. For example, a manufacturing company may be in charge of creating phones and batches. There's always a chance that a small number of these phones will be defective, and a company will want to estimate how many are in each batch, so they can model this problem with the Poisson variable, and use the resulting lambda to predict how many phones will be in how many batches. The normal distribution is too large of a topic to cover in just this video, so we'll focus on its parameters. Like the uniform distribution, the normal distribution has two parameters, the mean, which we usually denote mu, and the variance, which we denote sigma squared. The normal itself is usually denoted with some kind of fancy n. The normal distribution has a famous symmetric bell shape. It's not the only distribution with the bell shape, but it's most well known for this. The function that produces this particular bell shape is this. What the hell is even that? The shape of this distribution is decided by both the mean and variance. The mean is indicated by the highest point of the bell, right here in the middle. Changing the mean changes where this apex is. Since the peak of the distribution is at the mean, it's also the most likely value we'll observe in a normal distribution. As we get farther from the mean, values become much less likely. The variance changes how narrow or wide the bell is. Another way to think about this is it changes how concentrated the probability is around the mean. Stay tuned for a future employee training video on the normal distribution. You'll be fired if you don't watch it. These four distributions I mentioned account for the most common data we might encounter in the real world. There are many other parametric distributions, but they have more niche uses. This includes the t-distribution, chi-squared distribution, f-distribution, negative binomial, gamma, exponential, Laplace, Cauchy, and many more. One aspect of being a good statistician is to keep track of your assumptions. If you know what your assumptions are, you know what to check if your analyses don't make sense. Using a parametric family is often an assumption. It's totally plausible to go through with an entire hypothesis test on a parameter, reject the null hypothesis, and learn absolutely nothing because your model wasn't a good representation of reality. There are many ways that an assumption can be violated, but here's two examples to give you an idea of what might contraindicate a parametric family. In the end, a binomial random variable is just a bunch of Bernoulli random variables. 
For the binomial model to work, every one of these individual trials needs to have the same probability. That can work if everyone comes from a similar population, but imagine a clinical trial being conducted in many different hospitals. Each of these hospitals can have very different ways of working with very different patient populations. With this in mind, does it seem plausible for everyone to have their same response rate? Probably not. You might need a different model to account for this. If you assume data is normally distributed, it comes with a few stipulations. One is that there shouldn't be too many outliers in the sample. I've also mentioned that normally distributed random variables are supposed to be symmetric. If your data seems to have higher values that lean to one or the other side, your data generating process may be naturally skewed, so a normal assumption may be inappropriate. R provides several functions for working with parametric families. This isn't a technical term, but I'll call these functions the DPQR functions. Most parametric families have a set of DPQR functions, so if you understand how to use them with one family, you know how they work with others. For our code example, we use the normal distribution. R stands for random, and the rNorm function allows us to generate data from a normal distribution. We can tell this function how many data points we want to generate, and we can specify the mean and standard deviation of the normal we want to generate from. Note that I said the standard deviation and not the variance. The standard deviation is just the root of the variance, so it's an easy calculation to make. I'll simulate data from a normal distribution with mean zero and a standard deviation of one, also known as a standard normal. The end result is a bunch of simulated data. If I take the histogram of this data, it should resemble the distribution I specified. Here's a plot of the estimated histogram compared to the true probability distribution. If we have even more data, the two should resemble each other more. D stands for density. So the D norm function will give us the probability density for a normal distribution of a given mean and standard deviation. If I calculate the probability density of observing in the average value in a standard normal, I get about 0.398. If I compare that to the actual distribution, we can see that it matches up. Q stands for quantile. Quantiles are cut points that divide the range of a probability distribution into equal parts. You may have heard of quartiles, which divide into four parts, or percentiles, which divide into 100 parts. For example, the mean of a normal distribution represents the 50th percentile, because the probability of observing any value less than the mean is 50%. You don't need math for this, you can just see it by symmetry. To use the QNorm function, we need to give it a specific probability, as well as the parameters of the normal that we're looking at. If I put 50% or 0.5, the QNorm function should give me zero, and it does. In an annoying twist of fate, P for some reason stands for cumulative probability. If you know why it's P and not C, let me know in the comments because I still mix it up to this day. The P norm function gives us the cumulative probability of a particular normal distribution. Going off the previous example, we saw that the mean is the 50th quantile of the normal distribution, so we should also see this reflected in P norm. If I enter the value 0 into the P norm function, I get back the cumulative probability of 0.5. To use a different parametric family, we just need to switch out the root for the family. If I wanted to interact with the binomial random variable, I would need to use our binom and similar functions like that. Let's summarize everything we've learned in this video in a schema so you can get back to work. We assume a random variable to be generated according to some probability distribution, which is why we sometimes call a data generating process or the law of the data. We only ever observe the data, so this law is never directly known to us. We want to know what it is but estimating it might be hard because it's a function. One way we can simplify this problem is to assume that the probability distribution comes from a parametric family. A parametric family is convenient because we only have to estimate a few values called parameters, which decide the entire shape of the distribution. This is usually an assumption we make, so they are a form of simple statistical model. There are several examples of parametric families, some of which are so commonly used that we give them names. The uniform lets us model situations where all values are equally likely, Bernoulli distributions model metaphorical coin flips, and binomial distributions model many coin flips. The Poisson distribution models counts, and nobody cares about them. The normal distribution lets us model continuous data, as an extremely common to see for distributions and statistics. R gives us four functions that allow us to use probability distributions of parametric families in code, which we call the DPQR functions. D is for density, P is for cumulative for some reason, Q is for quantile, and R is for random. To use these functions, you just need to figure out what name to use after these letters. This has been a very normal therapeutics training video on parametric families. Note that watching videos is not paid for under company time.